Everyday College Journalism Speaker Series. I'm your host, Manolo Barco. Joining us today is Maria Perez, the Minority Affairs Reporter for your Naples Daily News. Maria, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Maria, can you talk to us a little bit about your background, some of the newsrooms that you've worked in, and some experience that you had in your uh, career, journalism career? Well, um, I started my journalism career in Spain, where I'm from. I um, was interning then in, and working in different, in a couple of national newspapers, ABC and El Mundo, also in uh, FN Newswire, uh, which is the largest uh, newswire in the world in Spanish. Then I came to the U.S. I did my master's in Columbia University. Um, from there, uh, Manny Garcia recruited me to go work to El Nuevo Herald, um, which is the sister paper of the Miami Herald in Spanish. And then from there, I went to the Naples Daily News, where I'm working currently. Mm. So those are it's a very very varied background. Talk to me about the importance of having a varied background. And also, you mentioned Manny. Uh, Manny's been a guest um, of the speaker series uh, several years ago. How important is it to have those mentors and those people that will kind of champion and help you out, uh, particularly when you're starting? You know, and, and mentors are always important, mm -hmm. no matter what stage of your career mm -hmm. you are. But you know, I'll talk a little bit about that. Oh my God, that's so important. <laughs> that's so essential when you are starting uh, in your career to have someone who believes in you, who believes. Because when you're starting, you have not yet proven a lot. Like you may have done two, three stories that are great, and you may have uh, good scores if you have them at a school mm -hmm. and. You may be promising your skills, your attitude, but you have not shown what you are able to do. So finding someone who believes in what you will be able to do in your potential mm -hmm. and gives you a chance and opens you doors, that's really important. Uh, for me, having money was, he opened basically for me the doors of uh, journalism here in the US by giving me a chance. Um, it's also really important to um, find good editors and uh, stay in touch with them. Uh, good editors are very scarce right now in the industry. So if you ever have one, uh, please don't just don't don't let separate. <laughs> don't let him go. Just keep in touch. Uh, run by that person ideas that you have, ask him about leads, where do you go. Also, uh, ask them about your career moves. Uh, what should I do next? Is this a good paper? Is this not? It's so important to have someone with more experience than you in, mm. in this world so that that person can guide you through your moves. Uh, so that, yeah, like if you guys have someone who who kind of can be your guide in this world, please, yeah, don't, don't lose that person. So obviously your, your academic background is pretty impressive. You went to Columbia University, you went to school also in Spain. But talk to me about the importance of actually getting practical experience. A lot of students make the mistake of thinking, okay, I have an A in my journalism J01-1100 J1 class but they don't get a lot of experience outside of the classroom. So mm. talk to me a little bit about how important that is in shaping your career, particularly at the very part, very uh, beginning of it. Uh, well, I think, yeah, you, you, learn, you really learn journalism in the streets. I guess university or your studies will give you the tools Mm -hmm. and we'll give you models to look at and we'll tell you wh how journalism is supposed to be. But really when you learn uh, journalism is on the streets, when you go knock on the doors of the victim of a crime and that person has died or the relatives of the person who's accused of committing that crime, that's how you learn how to interact with people, how to get the story, how to be humane too. Uh, when you have a story and you think, oh my God, how do I know if this happens more often than I thought? And then you start to think, oh, maybe there is data out there. So that's how you learn how to use data. Since, uh, since the very beginning, since I was a student of journalism in Spain, I, I did internships. Like my first year as a student of journalism, I applied to do an internship in, in a newspaper in Spain called ABC. Mm -hmm. And that was amazing. It taught me about journalism so much more than I, what I had learned in the previous year. 
Uh, so yeah, it's very important that uh, any students of journalism try to gain as soon as they can some experience in the real world. Was there a moment when you realized this is what I'm meant to do? Because sometimes a lot of students, particularly young, uh, you know, when you first start, you mm -hmm. haven't, you have like, I'm not, you're unsure. Right. But w at what point did you realize this is what I'm destined to do? And I'm good at, I'm really good at this. I don't know if there was a point in time, like a moment of clarity, of clearness in this issue. I think I I studied law kind of before in journal before journalism because it was a combined program and you started with law. And I always thought when I started doing I always had in mind doing journalism. I got offered a law uh, a law job at a really big and prestigious buffet law firm in Spain and I said like eh, I wanna try journalism. <laughs> That's what I want to do. And then, I don't know, when you go out and you write the stories, I always thought, like for me it was lo always, I love to learn about what's going on and I like to write a lot. So for me to be paid to do those things was like amazing. Wow, I can't believe I can do that. I guess my moment of validation was probably my second internship at mm -hmm. Aves, at Abethe, uh, this newspaper where I was covering local news. And that was amazing. Like I did a story. I was kind of talking to politicians and questioning them in like these press conferences that they said for like events, of promotional events. But then you get to ask questions, mm -hmm. and I could like ask them questions about hard stuff for them. I was. I wrote a story about how a train system in Madrid is not adapted to people with disabilities and they were blowing up all the deadlines and that. I get, I, I guess like when I started to do more investigative stories, that felt so good <laughs> that I was able to, to write them and to help people and to put in front of people who may not want to see these stories, hey, this is what I found. You should be a shame of this, like do something about this. I guess that was one of the moments when I started to have more fun with journalism. That. Awesome. Well, we're going to take a momentary break and we'll return with Maria Perez. Story at MDC. Be analytical. Be imaginative. Be a rising star. Be bold. Be connected. Be the solution. Be ready. What's your story? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Welcome back to the MDC Journals and Speaker Series. We're here with Maria Perez today. Maria, um, talk to us a little bit about the George Polk Award and what you know how that came about, the story that you did. For well, this is a story about um, undocumented immigrants who get hired to do very risky jobs, like in construction or landscaping. But then the companies they work for, or they, when they get hurt, and well, let me rewind a little bit about that. Then uh, when they get hired, companies don't check their documents. Uh, you know that a uh, very popular way of finding a job if you're an undocumented immigrant is to buy some social security card and um, a permanent resident card on the street. They are fake, obviously, and you give that to employers. Now, employers have the possibility of checking whether those documents are real if they use E-Verify, something called E-Verify. So these workers were hired by these companies uh, without, the, uh, without the employers checking their documents. But then when they got hurt on the job, then either the employer or the insurance company checked the documents and said, oh, you are undocumented, you shouldn't be here, you, you 
gave us uh, documents that were false. We're not going to pay for your benefits. They report them to the police. Uh, and these workers find themselves with uh, broken ribs or amputated fingers or some other injury, not receiving any medical care or, not, or any salaries that will keep them alive where they are not working. And they they get arrested, they they get thrown in jail, they face criminal charges, and they face deportation sometimes too, and they are left to care for their injuries on their own. So um, this story, um, I started to think about it when there was a raid in 2014 in a, a vegetables packing house in Naples. Um, state police uh, raided the business, uh, accused workers of uh, workers' compensation fraud. But when uh, some workers uh, were let out of the packing house, they were telling us, no, they are only checking our documents. And if they are false, they are taking them to jail. And if we are legally here, they are letting us go. And in the charging documents, there was nothing about anyone faking injuries. There was no one, nothing about anyone uh, lying about money or asking money from uh, for a workers' compensation injury. So I thought that was very strange. How can people be arrested of workers' compensation fraud if they are not lying about injuries, they are not trying to get any money from a workers' compensation claim? And uh, it turns out there was this law in the books that allows for uh, immigrants who are hired with uh, false papers, who presented false papers, um, to be arrested, accused of this charge. So I covered that, uh, the spot news. Uh, in the end, all these immigrants, more than 100 immigrants who were arrested were mm. given pretrial uh, program. I don't think uh, any one of them was deported, or at least ICE and the, the Obama administration said mm. that they were not gonna uh, pursue that uh, deportation proceedings for them. But they kept thinking, uh, and, and I saw some evidence that there were more workers who were arrested uh, across the country, so that's how I set to find more about about this, how, what was happening with this. And how do you go about getting a story? I'm assuming you faced a lot of resistance, and also the subjects that you needed to interview were probably very hesitant to talk to you. How did you gain confidence? How did you get go about getting this story? Ooh, ah, that was tough. Uh, I was very nervous. I was like, oh my God, no one is going to talk to me. Uh, <laughs> when I started to interview workers, it was after uh, Donald Trump had been elected uh, and the uh, immigrant community was kind of uh, more afraid of talking to the press and in general being in the spotlight. Um, so I tried to do it on the phone, didn't work, doesn't work. So um, basically I had built a database of people who had been arrested for the mm -hmm. CSU and I had put there the addresses, I built a map, I took, because I, I was in Milwaukee at the time, I did this story in part thank you to the O'Brien Fellowship that paid for my time devoted to, to this story. Took a plane to Florida and I started on a four weeks road trip, basically knocking on addresses all across right. Florida. Um, I think like my average was uh, one out of five people would talk with me. So like one out of five uh, addresses I knock on, I w there would be someone who would talk to me. It was difficult to get them to uh, get them to be able to use their full name. I'm very clear on that. I in this situation, I feel like with people who are not used to the media, you have to explain what you're gonna do, and you have to leave to leave it very clear whether they want. Uh, whether they are comfortable with their name being used or not. Obviously, I could for this type of a story, I didn't feel comfortable using uh, or uh, writing in people who didn't want to get their names used because I needed names, needed uh, to like so what was happening. So it basically came to talking with a ton of people and of those many people, there were a few who let me use their name, and there were even fewer who let me use their photos. And uh, I guess after talking with so many people, uh, the main character, the main person in our story was great. He let us 
he opened the doors of his house for us. He let us take photos and video, hang out with him. He was very open with what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, so it came to, I guess, knock on doors, let people see your face, be very honest with them. This is what I'm doing. I cannot promise this is gonna save you in any way, mm -hmm. but it's a way for you to tell your story, uh, not being dismissive, and just being very open, and then talking with many, many people. <laughs> and what happened as a result of the story? What came about? And also uh, the feedback that you got. I'm sure there was social media. There was a lot of people that were probably not happy about the story and people that were obviously happy about the story. So tell me a little bit about the feedback and also uh, what happened as a result of the story. I guess we were very careful <coughs> from the beginning to cast it not only as this people are suffering, but also these companies are taking advantage of this situation. These companies are employing these workers in jobs where they know a lot of the candidates are gonna be undocumented. And then when they get injured on the job, they cut them out of any of the labor rights they may have. Um, so we try to focus in, in that kind of hypocrisy of the system that we have. So I guess that kind of made the comments who, you know, of people who don't agree uh, and are against uh, illegal immigration uh, a little softer because we were exposed in the companies, we were exposed in the people who were taking advantage of it. Uh, so yeah, but yeah, n n never mind, there were people who who said, no, they, they should, this wouldn't have happened to them if they hadn't come here. You, I mean, you, they, they are their opinions and like you can learn from those opinions. Uh, but they also, but the funny thing is they also said, usually the company should be punished too, which didn't happen. Like we only found one employer in 10 years who had been arrested, accused of knowingly hiring workers with, workers. with false documents. We're gonna take a momentary break and we'll return to the uh, Miami Dade College Journals of Speaker Series. at MDC. Be analytical. Be imaginative. Be a rising star. Be bold. Be connected. Be the solution. Be ready. What's your story? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Welcome back to the Miami Dade College Journals and Speaker Series. We're here with Maria Perez. Maria, um, before the break, you were talking about uh, the story that you did uh, that helped you win the George Polk Award. Uh, talk to us a little bit more about, like, so a lot of times people, you know, as journalists, you need to stay neutral. Um, you're not advocating for anything, but a lot of times when you write a story like this, people think that you're an advocate on both sides. You know, some people might think that you're advocating, other people think that, oh, she is our defender. So talk to me about the importance of being neutral and how tough it is in a story like this uh, to do it. Right. Yeah, sometimes it's tough. Um, to, remain, to remain neutral, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you have to, I mean, for me it's more about being fair and telling the truth in a story. Um, and with that I mean, you cannot say a way of exposing injustice because someone, or abused, because someone is gonna think you are advocating for the abused. That's a big part of what journalism is, to expose stories of people who abuse other people and tell the stories of people who are abused. Um, I guess uh, you have always to, uh, if, you, if you are dealing with like advocacy groups, for example, who, sometimes you have to say, they tend to see you sometimes like as their friend, you have to say, 
sometimes, hey, I'm not, I'm not your friend, I'm not uh, an ally, I am a witness, I'm not here to help your cause, I'm here to be your testimony of what's happening, and you have to have that very clear, and sometimes uh, you have to say that, and like, for the most part, advocacy groups know that, but sometimes, like, you know, you can have a very good source, and, mm -hmm. like, the lines get a little bit blurry, and, like, you have to, like, you know, you have to remind that person, and I think they appreciate that. Um, you have to give the first share of comment to the part, to the other part, to the other side. You have to try by all means to get their um, their their best arguments in the story. And it's not just that uh, you don't just make a phone call and say, "Oh, I tried." No, you have to make several phone calls. You go to their place if it is possible. You send them letters. You try to convince them to talk to you because honestly the story benefits from from the input of uh, the other person that you're writing about mm -hmm. so for me in the stories is about telling the truth uh, getting in every element that is relevant to the story and giving to the other side uh, getting in the story their best arguments against the position that other people are taking and then uh, there are people who are still gonna say that you are an advocate but like you can there's yeah. nothing you're, you're not gonna stop uh, writing about abuse and about injustice just because there are some people who think that's been an advocate talk to us about this bill that was introduced as yeah, uh, after this story ran um, well there was a similar story but by ProPublica, well, uh, on the same issue that also was published. So there was a legislator, a senator in the Florida legislature that introduced a bill that would basically stop these practices, like companies uh, would, ha would have to pay benefits to workers uh, no matter what their immigration status is, and uh, they wouldn't be able to be arrested, accused of workers' compensation fraud because of mm -hmm. this issue. That bill uh, passed uh, one commission in the Senate, but then it died, and one of the main challenges is that they didn't find in time a sponsor in the House. But some legislators told me that sometimes uh, that, they, that they wanted to press for the bill this year, this session, mm -hmm. and you know, sometimes for a, it takes for a bill to pass uh, a few sessions. So don't know what will happen, but um, yeah, there was at least some attempt to, to reform the law. Maria, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the more interesting stories? It doesn't have to be necessarily your top stories, but maybe some that are quirky, a little bit offbeat, something a little bit different that's happened in your career. Um, I don't know. I, I, in Miami, I covered a lot of crime, um, <laughs> a lot, but that's not happy or quirky. I like, I mean, there's one story that is not important, but I liked a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about the 75th anniversary of a Mexican, um, a Ticano couple from Mexico who used to work in Imokali, Imokali, um, an immigrant town in Collier County. And they were having their 75th anniversary, wedding anniversary. <laughs> So they were very old, but they, uh, the, the man, the husband always bought flowers for for the wife, and they like to dance, and they seem so happy. So diving in their story was a way to show the important. They were they used to be they was to be, they used to be migrants. Uh, they work in agriculture, and they moved from Florida up. So. Is that looking into their 75th anniversary was a way to look not only into their lives and into this amazing story of like a couple who <laughs> have been together for 75 years and they not hate each other, uh, but also in the history of uh, uh, these migrant workers uh, who came from Texas to Florida and have this family and how things used to be in the in, in in at work when they migrated and how things were changing and this and the history of Immokalee. Um 
Uh, I like that. It's, it's a, a feature. change of pace. Yeah. It's not a watchdog uh, piece, but I kind of like doing that. There was also a story that I like, although it was very tough. Um, got an interview with a victim of sef- sex trafficking. Uh, well, a few interviews. So I was able to get with her into like the mechanisms of how it works, how it feels for a person to be a sex slave, um, how how it works in your mind, how co- you can be a prisoner of someone even if you're not tied with chains. Um, and kind of allow me to get open a window into another world. So that's another story I liked. Although it was not joyful to do it, but I liked doing. Um, then there are some stories, the stories that I like the most are stories about people who are vulnerable and are being exploited. I wrote about a worker who got who died on his job, but his family didn't get any money. That's different from, from this story. Or about low-income residents that were being uh, foreclosed because of past maintenance fees that were really, really expensive. Um, kids in Collier County, too, immigrant teenagers who were not allowed in high school uh, because they were deemed too old when they were 16 or 17. So you get to meet people from all walks of life. Uh, Maria, thank you for being on the show today, um, and we will return to you next time um, at the NBC Journalism Speaker Series. See you soon.